So um, this is a, a bandana that I bought on the street in New York City. It's not something I would normally purchase. I'm just putting that out there. It's the Stars and Stripes. I think it says I Love the USA. Um, I was in Washington DC uh, with John Howard on September 11, 2001. So we were there when the planes crashed into the buildings in New York and when the plane crashed just across the river from us into the Pentagon and it was a pretty chaotic period. We had been scheduled to go up to New York on the 12th of um, September. He was addressing the Congress in Washington and then the travelling media were to follow him to New York where we were supposed to go to the World Financial Centre at the base of the World Trade Centre. So you can imagine everything changed. He was flown out on Air Force Two on the Vice President's plane, the only aircraft allowed to fly in US airspace which was closed at that time. Uh, and the, those of us in the media were just working around the clock reporting on these events. And I went up to New York that night on um, the train, which had then, uh, the, the railways were, had stopped for a while, but they allowed the trains to start again. And of course, we wanted to get up to New York to report on the situation there. Our newspaper, my newspaper I was working for at home was keen to get news. We had been booked into the Waldorf Astoria Hotel, very fancy hotel, um, and it was pretty hard to get another hotel room because the city was just in chaos. So I rang them and hung on to that booking and arrived sort of late in the evening uh, and they'd set up security screening at the doors and just the city was, it was shocked. And I went straight downtown to see how close to the World Trade Centre site I could get. Um, and it was dark and the buildings had collapsed so the air was full of this horrible dust which had human remains and um, building remains and everything in it. And I had to talk my way through some police barricades to get down as close to the site as I could. And uh, it was, I was coughing because the air was so disgusting. And on the street in the dark appeared these couple of kids, African American <coughs> kids selling souvenirs. Um, and they had spotted a um, a hole in the market, given all the stuff in the air, and they were selling these things to put around your face. And so I bought one and wore it uh, while I was reporting in the streets that night and hung on to it. I mean, it, it doesn't have any particular sentimental value for me. Um, the Canberra Times reported that I carried it everywhere with me to Afghanistan, which is, I'm, I'm afraid, <laughs> slightly exaggerated. I didn't carry it anywhere with me other than home. Um, but I have kept it, I guess. And it's, I suppose it represents um, something that had a huge impact on me personally, but also on my professional development and my professional life. I went to um, Afghanistan three times as a reporter in the years that followed when the war was underway. Uh, embedded with the Australian Defence Force and eventually wrote a book about the political backstory to how we got from those, those two days at the beginning, the September 11 and the days that followed, how we got from there to 10 years at war, um, who said what to whom and how a war is made. And so I suppose this is the thing that represents that for me uh, in a sense. It was the sort of only thing I brought home that has an association with that period, um, which was a pretty tumultuous period reporting wise but also it had a huge impact on me personally because that whole city was just shaken to the core people walking around the streets in the days and trying to help each other do something anything that could <coughs> there were walls of photographs of missing people and I remember someone in a business suit coming up on the street I was looking at these the next day I was looking at these pictures on the wall and um, this guy was carrying sandwiches and just offering them to strangers would you like something to eat? Because there was nothing else that you could actually do. No one could do anything. Everything was sort of out of their control. And I just was struck by this, pe people trying to cope any way they could. So I suppose that represents that to me and, and where my working life went after that. Um, but other than that, it doesn't have a particular sentimental value. And as I say, it's quite cheesy, really. <laughs> <laughs> but it served a purpose at the time. I was very gra grateful to not be breathing in all that horrible dust in the air. Professionally, it it was, a, it was a big tipping point at September 11 and, and mm. the days afterwards. Did you know that day that you were going to become a war correspondent in the, in the traditional no, sense of I, the word? No, but I knew... Because that's what you became. No, but I knew it, it was... At least um, that part of your journalism. Some things, you know, some things I think you experience in journalism, you don't realise the impact of them at the time. It's not until later you look back and think, wow, that was a really significant moment. But I did know the impact of that at the yeah. time. We knew that when we were there in Washington. And you know, it was quite clear that this was actually going to change the direction of world events and you felt very much that you were at the heart of that. And I had strange emotions about it because 
I had very dear friends who lived in New York and one of, one of them was in the building. Um, he got out, he was on the lower floors, but, and I, my really close New York friends had been married just eight weeks earlier, so I'd been over there at their wedding and seen all of those close friends quite recently. And in fact, I wrote about, mentioned these guys in the book, my friends Liz and Greg, um, she's a food writer on a newspaper in New York and they had gone, um, they had gone the night before, so the night of September 10, they'd gone up the World Trade Center towers to the greatest bar on earth, it was called. Um, she knew the guy that ran the restaurant and bar there and he'd been hassling her for ages to come and do his cocktail mixing course because she was a food writer. So she, they had gone there on the night of September 10 and they were going to be taking me there on the night of September 12, um, which of course it, that never happened. Um, so she wrote this amazing uh, piece for her paper called The Last Night of the Greatest Bar on Earth because some of those staff, um, they'd had functions the following morning, so they had done a double shift, worked late at night and then gone in early in the morning and were killed. And the guy who ran the bar, it was the first day of school, September is the start of the school year in the US, and the next day was the first day of school and he took his child to school, so he was a little bit late arriving to work mm -hmm. and he lived and a lot of his staff didn't. So I had these, you know, I, I knew that they'd been to the bar because they told me they were going, these friends of mine, and so I had these weird emotions of, uh, is everyone all right? What's happening in New York? I, you know, it was just complete chaos, this sort of tug between the personal connection and the professional job you had to do. And we all had to do a professional job. We worked, I think we worked for 22 hours without stopping. We were in this massive, sort of this very fancy hotel right next to the White House in Washington. and. Um, you know, it was quite strange. It became this very surreal atmosphere where they sent most of the staff home. They just had a skeleton staff. I remember us all sitting in this room. They'd created a media room for us, working away like this. And at one point, they, they wheeled in this one of those hotel... You know, sometimes a hotel brings a trolley with food. It was a giant round table on wheels covered in steak sandwiches. And they wheeled it into the middle of the room and we all just spun around ate the steak sandwiches and they took it away and we just kept on working. Um, just strange things that you remember but it, the whole experience was really crazy and um, yeah I didn't know then that I would go and end up in Afghanistan. We didn't, we didn't know, we knew that, that, that there'd be a military response. John Howard said straight away, um, you know, we'll, we'll do whatever and that was controversial in itself and I wrote about that and I got mm. some hate mail. Mm. Um, someone wrote to me calling me a traitor because I would questioned whether we should be giving a carte blanche commitment to whatever without knowing what whatever was going to be. Um, and you were in the room with John Howard when uh, a plane hit the Pentagon, yeah. weren't you? So was... we, were, we were having a news conference which had been scheduled from the night before. Um, he was going to be having a news conference that following morning. It was a Tuesday morning <coughs> in, in Washington and uh, you might remember the Tampa, the, the asylum seekers issue was really huge. They'd turned the asylum seekers away on the Norwegian freighter, the Tampa. So there was this issue running at home that we were very interested in. And John Howard had scheduled this press conference. And just before the time of the press conference, the first plane hit the building in New York, and then the second plane. Mm -hmm. And he went ahead with the press conference. We were all, nobody quite knew what to make of all of this. And there's, it's kind of shameful now, but there's this sort of whole series of questions. He first of all sort of started talking and said something sort of benign about what had happened because he didn't know either, made a short statement and then we all sort of sat there. I was stunned, I couldn't speak at all and other people were asking questions about asylum seekers from home. It was just very weird and because we were in a room where the cameramen like to balance the light to make sure that they, get, they don't get um, conflict from outside light indoors, we would pulled the curtains closed behind him um, and then suddenly all the secret US Secret Service appeared at the back of the room and um, we ripped the curtains open and the plane had hit the Pentagon across the river while we were there. Had we had the curtains open, it would have been direct line of sight, but we didn't see it crash, but you could see the smoke and suddenly, you know, there were all the American Secret Service sort of ripping John Howard away and mm. we he, all went out got, to the street. He got carried. He got carried. Away, didn't he? Well, he, did got he, away, he got bundled away, and they away. didn't yeah. really know what to do with him to start with. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, he was the only visiting head of. Um, yeah. I'm not going to make any further comment on that. Yeah. <laughs> they, he was the only visiting head of government who mm. was in the country at the time, and they were careful. They wanted to make sure that he was okay, but he was sort of also a problem for them. Mm. They had to look after him, and they ended up taking him up to the embassy, mm. um, and we all followed eventually on foot. Um, we all kind of scattered, journos scattered out into the streets to try and report on it. And within a few minutes, 
the National Guard were out, the fire engines, the police, everybody was trying to get out of the city. It was just absolute bedlam. And we sort of legged it up to the embassy. The phone system crashed. And, um, and then we, we had another press conference with, with John Howard some hours later in the embassy theatre. And by that stage, the buildings had come down and everybody was sort of stunned. And that was where he said, we'll do whatever we have and if, to do. If I remember from your book as well, John Howard uh, flies to Hawaii on Air Force Two, the vice president's plane, uh, and is then taken from uh, Hawaii back to Australia on a Qantas plane. But in a press conference, he actually switched off the microphones and said to the journalists, I'm sorry, I can't take you all with me. And some people felt that was just a token effort. Other people felt that it was a genuine uh, connection with human beings at a, at a time that was so... I remember how the turmoil people experienced at that time, and this object for me, it's, it's about that grabbing things, you know, trying to survive, and yeah. um, mm. it's, it's not a choice, you know, that you'd make in an object in any other way. No, no, and so I suppose that represents all that whole period which just was really bizarre. Yeah, he did, that was a press conference on the lawns of the Ambassador's residence on the afternoon of the 12th of September, um, and then, yeah, he asked for the cameras to be turned off and then said, you know, he'd, he'd already told us he was leaving, that the Americans had made the vice president's plane available. And then he said, um, oh, look, I'm, you know, I'm really sorry that I have to leave you here. I can't take you with me. We had all come on commercial aircraft, but he, was, he felt, I think, responsible. And I think it was genuine. He felt responsible for leaving us in this situation, and he was going. And we're like, are you kidding? It's the biggest story in the world. We're not going anywhere. <laughs> so it was very nice of him, but like, see ya. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, have, have a nice flight. And so, we'll let the, we'll let the Canberra Bureau pick you up at the other end. Yeah. Yeah. But the funny, be fine. They can file ad pass to our stories. There is a funny postscript to that. Like, they flew him to Hawaii, and then they sort of dumped him there, and there was a Qantas plane that had been scrambled to come and pick him up. There were some Taiwanese officials who were in Hawaii. They weren't as senior as a prime minister, but they had heard that the Australian Prime Minister was getting flown out mm -hmm. and they tried to hitch a ride on the Qantas flight and wanted a ride on the Qantas flight out and, um, and they were told no, they weren't allowed. The Americans just didn't want any complications. They had allowed one Australian aircraft in to pick up this particular person and his group and fly out because airspace in Hawaii was sh shut as well. Mm -hmm. um, and no, they weren't allowed to come and they were allowed to fly the Qantas plane direct to Canberra where he was supposed to be coming. Um, but the crew at the airport in Canberra was supposed to come in early because the plane was arriving and somebody slept in. So the air traffic control tower was empty as the plane arrived, no answer, circled and had to fly back to Sydney where the sacked ANSET workers whose airline had been closed down on September 11 were waiting for the Prime Minister. <laughs> so he then had to address angry uh, ANSET workers and the head of the Prime Minister's department, Max Moore Wilson, I'm told, I think the phrase I used was that the language he used could be heard on the ground. Um, he was not, not happy. I don't know what happened to the air traffic controller whose alarm didn't go off. But it's a classic, one of those just funny um, postscripts on a huge story that you don't hear about at the time, but you find out later.